Hello and welcome to our next video on the classical period. This will cover part four of your textbook, chapters three through six. Chapter three is on sonata form, so we'll be looking at that in just a minute. Chapter four is on theme and variations. Chapter five is on the minuet and trio. And chapter six is on the rondo. These are all forms that were uh, used in the classical period uh, quite a bit and if you recall what our definition of a musical form is it basically is a uh, structure by which um, musical ideas can be applied because uh, composers come up with musical ideas but then they also need a framework in which to um, express those musical ideas so we are going to be starting with sonata form and your textbook does a pretty good job of explaining the major sections of it. I have also made a diagram to help you with sonata form. So hopefully this diagram will make it um, a little more apparent and then we're going to look at an example. So um, real quick on how to find a sonata form diagram, go under study guide section and look for this post right here. You can click the attach file there or right click it and choose save as if you want to save a copy for yourself. Um, so let's look at what sonata form is. Your textbook mentions that sonata form is one of the most widely used forms, um, not just in the classical period, but also uh, future periods, including modern day times. Um, music uh, composers still use sonata form, or at least some variation of it. Uh, it is a very flexible form. It, it's not so rigid and exacting that composers, you know, feel a little constrained. Um, and the cool thing is, is like you can listen to a sonata, um, a, move, a sonata form movement by um, Mozart and then you can listen to one by Haydn and you can hear that even though they're using the same form they express themselves quite differently so a composer is really allowed to be expressive it gives them uh, uh, some framework to kind of organize their ideas but it doesn't limit you know their options um, but we are going to look at uh, the main sections of sonata form and once you understand the main sections when you listen to a piece of music that uses this form and you're aware of it as you listen along I think that you'll find that you're far more engaged uh, with the piece of music and it makes it a lot easier to listen to also understanding the relationships between the various musical themes and see how they interact it's it's kind of like watching a movie or something where you have characters you're introduced to characters and then you're you know you see them interact and see how they interact and that's what makes a movie interesting um, think about how when you're watching a movie like the generally speaking most people who make movies know they have about 10 minutes to grab your attention so in the opening 10 minutes of a film or something then they've got to introduce you to something kind of interesting and grab you and music's very much the same way um, you know they want to give you something to start chewing on right off the bat and so we're going to be looking at a piece by Mozart here in a minute where within the first couple minutes he introduces you to different music themes and then they start interacting uh, shortly after that. Okay, so the main sections of sonata form, you have the opening section which is called the exposition, which should be pretty easy to remember because it's exposing you to the principal themes. Then you have the development, and if you think about what a development is, musically speaking, when we talk about development in music, we're talking about, um, you know, taking musical ideas and then setting them in new settings, uh, changing the key or uh, putting them uh, with, you know, changing the rhythm or taking a fragment of the melody or something like that. Basically, it's, it gives the chance for the composer to play with a, a musical idea. Um, if this were, if you're thinking in the structure of like a story, then the v development sections where you put your characters in some kind of peril or you give them some kind of obstacle that they have to overcome. And so the development section is kind of the, um, the interesting part of it um, because there's instability, there's tension. 
and it's the most unstable. It's the highest, high, highest part of the tension of the entire movement. So um, then you come to the recapitulation. And I know that looks like a big fancy word. It is kind of a big fancy word, but um, we actually use an abbreviated version of this word quite a bit. Uh, if you ever hear someone say we're going to recap what we talk about talked about at the last meeting, that basically is a variation of this word recapitulation. So practice saying it a few times just to get it down. And one of the things you're going to learn about the recapitulation is that it's extremely similar to the exposition. Um, the overall structure can be think of, thought of, of like the exposition, exposition being A, the development being kind of a, a B, a departure from that, and then coming back to A again. Um, and you're going to see the overall structure as we listen to a piece. Um, the recapitulation, when you come back to that, that's when you have the release of the tension, you have resolution, and we're going to see how the composers accomplish that here in a minute. And your textbook mentions that there may be a coda. There actually may be an introduction before the exposition. We're going to see that in the diagram. Uh, coda in Italian just means tail. It's just a concluding section where you kind of give some final resolution to the piece and it makes it sound complete and it makes it feel like you've been on a journey but now you've come home and now everything is good you know uh, another way I like to explain it is that the exposition is boy meets girl you have two primary themes first theme and second theme um, and there's a bridge that separates them or a transition section uh, we're also going to learn they're going to be in different keys. So it's like boy meets girl, you know, the typical romantic comedies. Usually if the boy meets the girl, there's some kind of difference that they have or they don't necessarily like each other or they have, there's some kind of misunderstanding, you know. Um, the development section, you know, they you see the two themes, try to work things out, um, but there's usually some kind of big misunderstanding or big argument or some kind of confusion that looks like it's going to end the relationship. So boy loses girl in the development. And then in the recapitulation, boy gets girl back. And then I think of the coda is kind of like the nice little wedding at the end. It's kind of like, or the fast forward where you see they have kids. It's just a nice little icing uh, and cherry on top of the cake. And it gives you that kind of final sense of resolution. But I do want to go to the chart here that I've developed, and I want to point out some things. Uh, first of all, notice I mentioned here that the classical period, even though we saw in the Baroque we did have the term sonata, which comes from a, uh, the Latin root word of sonata means uh, basically to play, as opposed to a cantata, which meant to sing. So it, it's an instrumental-based uh, piece of music. But it really wasn't until the classical period that they really started coming up with an exact form. In the Baroque period, sonata could apply to basically any kind, type of uh, instrumental piece of music. But ever since the classical period... Um, Many composers began calling it sonata form. Uh, some of them ne necessarily didn't call it that, but they used it. So um, we're going to look here at uh, the introduction section, which is not really you know pointed out in your book. It, they do mention that there may be an introduction, but it's not actually in, in your list here. So I included that here. Notice that it's kind of grayed out, and I've got optional next to it. And the same goes for Dakota. It's kind of grayed out and optional as well. Um, every sonata form will have an exposition development and recapitulation. However, some have an introduction, some have a coda, some have both. All right, so the introduction is usually slow if you have one. Uh, and then that material may actually reappear again later. Um, the one that we're going to look at does not have an introduction. It goes right into the first theme. And if you recall, a musical theme is, is a musical idea, usually identified primarily by its melody, that is reused throughout a composition. So if you think of, of this in like movie terms again, it's like a main character. You know, you have many characters in a, in a play or a movie, but you really only have a handful of major characters that reappear and you follow throughout the story. So I've chosen this blue color here to represent the first theme because you'll see here it's presented in the home key. 
Now, I realize that when you're listening to these pieces of music, you probably can't listen to it and, and be like, oh, well, that's the key of G major or that's the key of A minor. Um, you're not going to always be conscientiously aware of what key these pieces are in. However, your brain is going to take notice of it and your brain is going to automatically associate this theme with this key as it does any piece of music. Your, your brain doesn't probably know the exact pitch unless if you were, like I said, born with perfect pitch or something like that. Uh, but it is, it is trying to figure out the music mathematically and it's taking note of the relationship between the notes and the scales and the chords and all that stuff. So whether or not you actually know all that theory or not, your brain is still processing it. It does help to be aware of this stuff and be conscious of it. And that's why, you know, we're looking over this stuff. All right, so you have your main theme in the home key. And notice I can put group here too. Uh, not can put. Notice that I put group here because in some sonata um, movements, you will see composers use a group of themes. Um, however, an example we're going to look at, it's pretty straightforward. There's just a, a single theme in the first um, section. Notice we have a transition here which goes from the blue color into the orange color and this orange color is going to represent our alternate key. Um, now if, depending on what key you start with will determine what the secondary or alternate key is and I'm not going to get into that because that's really getting a little more in depth than a basic music appreciation class would get into. Um, if you are a music major, you will talk, you know, you will learn what the home keys are and what the alternate keys are, depending on whether or not you're in a major or minor key to start with. But we're not going to get into that. It's not anything you'll have to know for a quiz or anything. Just know that the first theme is in one key and then you transition. You have this transition period here. Uh, your textbook likes to call it a bridge and it bridges the you know from the first theme into the second theme and it changes key now most composers are pretty good at changing this key and not making it very obvious it's not going to sound like one piece of music's playing and then bam it right in the middle someone turns the radio dial and you're into a second so this is a transition notice that i purposely had the colors kind of fade into each other because before you know it bang you're in the second key and again your mind's paying attention to this whether you're conscious of it or not now this creates drama because it creates a harmonic tension between the two keys then you usually have a closing section. Notice what color it is. It's in the orange color. It's in the alternate key. And expositions almost always go back and repeat because composers really want you to be familiar with the first key and the second key and the first theme and the second theme and to set up the conflict between those. You'll notice that the overall arc is on the right here. We have harmonic tension that's developed between the two different keys here. Then we have instability and this is where we get to the development. We have new treatment of the themes. Now you will notice here that new themes can be introduced in the development but most of the classical composers did like to develop the first or second or both of those themes in the development section. And I'm not sure why the ES is off there. <laughs> I have to maybe fix that. I just noticed is that a mistake with the uh, Photoshop here? Nope. Apparently that is a little error on my part, so I'll probably uh, try to fix that. I just updated this and made some revisions to it, and apparently I made a little blunder there. All right, so notice this says most unstable, and notice that the colors in the background, what do they do? They go they, from one shade to the next shade. They're all over the place because you're going through quick key changes, what we call modulation. We had that term way back in part one. That's when you change key. And notice that it, it creates the most unstable part because especially harmonically. Now, there's different things you can do with the themes too, and notice that they're often fragmented, and we're going to see where Mozart does that in this piece here in a second. But the main thing you need to know is that this is very unstable. Uh, in classical works this tends to be a rather short section and at the end it, it sounds like um, 
you, you almost feel like you're being thrown all over the place because you're constantly changing keys, you're not playing the themes in their entirety, you're just taking little motives from them uh, and by little fragments, little parts of them. But then at the end, it's going to set up a return to the home key. So you're going to want to go back to the home key, and this is where we enter the recapitulation. You'll know you're in the recapitulation because it will sound identical to the beginning of the exposition. Notice that this right here and this right here look identical. Now here is the big difference. You notice how transition here stays the same color and what color is it? It's the color of the home key. So instead of modulating or changing key in the transition it's the same material here in the bridge or transition whatever you want to call it However, you stay in the home key, and even the second theme stays in the home key. See how it's like boy gets girl back and they work out their differences? Now they're all in the same uh, wavelength here, they're in the same key. It says here, just like the exp exposition, but with all sections in the home key. Even that closing section that was originally in the alternate key, it's in the home key now. And again, you may have a coda at the end. If you do have a coda, it's going to end in the home key, obviously, because it's going to give you that final sense of resolution. Um, there's some additional stuff here I included that you should know. Uh, your textbook makes it a point to point this out. You should not confuse a sonata with sonata form. And uh, there's actually a clarification I need to make in one of your study guides, uh, because I had a bit of an error here that I need to fix too. You can see here that word form is not supposed to be in there. That's a bit of a typo. Um, I, I make a distinction between sonata allegro form or sonata form and you will sometimes, you'll see me mention that here in a minute, you'll see it's sometimes called sonata allegro form. Uh, however, when you look at the study guide, please take that form out there, and I'm going to try to fix that and get the updated version on Blackboard ASAP. But a sonata is a multi-movement form for one or more instruments. We're going to learn that it is usually in three movements. So this is the thing that confuses students, is that there is, that what we've been talking about is sonata form. It is a single movement form that is used as one of the movements of like a symphony or sonata or something like that. If it's just sonata, if you don't have the word form on the end, then that's an entirely different beast. And I know it's confusing, but um, just try to remember that when it's a movement, it's two words. When it's um, a multi-movement piece, it's one word. And it'll make more sense when we actually do uh, talk more about the sonata. All right, so it shouldn't be confused with a sonata, which is a multi-movement composition. Uh, Beethoven, one of his most famous piano sonatas, is called uh, the Moonlight Sonata. Now, he didn't call it that. Later people gave it that title. But you uh, may be familiar with the Moonlight Sonata. If not, then just Google it and YouTube it or whatever. Um, I'm sure once you hear the opening few notes, you'll recognize it. But um, that is a type of sonata that's in three movements. And um, sonata form is entirely different, what we've been talking about here. Now, in sonatas, as well as symphonies and string quartets and concerti, but concerti, by the way, is a plural of, plural of concerto. In America, it, it is proper for us to say concertos. That is an acceptable um, spelling if you look in Webster's Dictionary. Uh, however, the proper Italian plural is concerti. So if you hear people say concerti or concertos, they're talking about the plural of the classical concerto, which we're going to be looking at later. We're also going to be looking at symphonies later, string quartets later, and sonatas. All of these are multi-movement pieces of music. So if you went and saw one of these in concert, you would have the first movement, then second movement, then third movement, and so forth. As a matter of fact, your smart book, um, I'm sorry, your textbook, not just a smart book, it makes mention uh, in chapter one of the classical period uh, about movement structure in the classical period. So you may want to go back and, and review that because it talks about it. Where is it? Yeah, right here. Classical forms, how they usually have a first movement that's fast, second movement slow, third movement is dance related, fourth movement is fast. Uh, we went over that in our last video. Um, so one of these movements that could be used here, I'll go back to it real quick. 
um, like the first movement is usually sonata form that we've been talking about so let's say you go to a symphony and you you're getting ready to hear the first few notes of it it's the first movement well you're probably going to hear it uses this form or some variation of this form but that's just the first movement when the first movement's over then it goes on to the next movement which is probably going to be something different however sonata form can be used for any movements in any of the compositions uh, if you think of like uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, the ba 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 bum ba 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 bum that opens up the first movements in sonata form that we have here. And then Beethoven also uses it for the final movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. All right, so it can be used for any form. However, it definitely is a favored choice for the first movement. You will find it most likely being in the, as the first movement. Um, sometimes we do call it sonata allegro form due to its tempo usually being fast. However, there are examples of composers using it for slow movements. So sometimes that second movement, if it's a slow movement or it's say it's even a third movement that could be slow, um, they may use sonata form. Sonata form is extremely versatile. Uh, basically, I've already said that before, um, so we'll skip over it. The transition found in exposition and recapitulation is sometimes called a bridge. So, yeah, we mentioned that before as well. So look over this, um, this guide here, this uh, diagram, and feel free to uh, use that as, as a type of study guide for sonata form. I try. I think it's a little easier than the you know kind of boring study guide that you have because um, it's got colors and stuff like that and visuals that are designed to help you. Now we are going to, to look at a live performance here of the same piece that you have in your smart book as, as an example of sonata allegro form or sonata form, however you want to call it. So if you look in chapter three, you have this piece by Mozart, Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor. And this will be, of course, the 40th symphony that Mozart wrote, um, that he actually published, and this is in G minor. Now, you may be wondering what this K stands for here. There's a little asterisk here, and it, it, it points out that uh, there was a guy named Ludwig von Kerschel, and he actually cataloged most of Mozart's compositions. Uh, Mozart wrote over 600 pieces of music while he was alive. Now we see this one is Kerschel 550. And so if you remember that, that Mozart published around 600 pieces of music while he was alive, then you know that this was written fairly late in Mozart's life. This is one of the final symphonies that he actually wrote. If you recall, Mozart died uh, just short of his 36th birthday so had he lived to be longer he could have gone on to write more pieces but this is towards the end of his life but if you ever see the K mark um, and other composers sometimes have catalog marks too so if you ever see a number uh, it always helps to look up how many total pieces they wrote and obviously if you look at a piece and it's like Kershaw 4 you know that that's you know when Mozart was very young and wasn't as experienced as, say, Kerschel 550. So Mozart is a seasoned composer of symphonies by this time, and he uses good old sonata form for the opening movement. And here you have a score uh, printout of what the main theme is. And the main theme is, when you listen to it, you'll recognize it goes da 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 like that. And so when we listen to this live performance that's going to be theme one that we talked about because remember I said there's no introduction in this we're gonna start right off with the exposition and if you open up your listening guide that you have uh, for this you'll notice that it says bang right there main theme in the violins so what we're gonna do is we're going to use this chart here and I'm going to let the, the music play. However, I am going to turn the volume down just a little bit because I'm going to be talking over top of these people. And you can also try to uh, pause the video after we go over this and then listen to this entire thing on your own and see if you can hear some of the things I'll be talking about. So um, let's look at the... the 
the chart here and I'm going to start the video and then switch back to the chart here quickly. First of all I'm going to make sure that the level is not too loud and then we're going to point out some things. So listen for that main melody to start right off the bat. So there's our main melody. It's our first theme. It's in the home key. In this case it's G minor, but you don't necessarily again have to know that. But your brain is taking note of that. Right, now the theme is starting to repeat here. But notice it goes in a slightly different direction. transition to the new key and there's our second theme in a different key and again I want to point out that the secondary theme is is different than the first so we're gonna wind it back here notice the first theme again the first theme sounds kind of uh, frantic doesn't it sounds like a kind of a controlled frantic nature to it but it sounds a bit unstable unrelaxed now if we go back to uh, the secondary thing the secondary theme you'll notice is much more relaxed it's more sweet it's more passive here's the second theme again so we're in the second theme and now you notice that the themes are contrasting in mood because that's a, again a characteristic of classical pieces. The themes don't always contrast quite as much in, in this piece. If you listen to the piano concerto that we'll look at later on by Mozart, the, the first two themes are really not all that different in mood but they are in different keys and that's the main thing to keep in mind is we're setting up a harmonic tension here even though a lot of times the themes are often in different moods as well. Alright, let's listen some more. Still in the second theme here. Closing section here. Closing section in this case actually quotes. Closing section quotes a little bit of the first thing. That butta bum butta bum. If Mozart is following the you know the usual form the exposition will go back and repeat so everything we just heard will be an exact repetition it doesn't always happen that way but most of the time it does so let's see if Mozart went with that option ah yes sounds just like our beginning doesn't it see how the beginning second time that we hear it. This is the, the exposition repeating again there. And I'm not going to make you sit through and listen through this whole thing again. We're going to fast forward now. We're going to find this closing section and then we're going to notice that because this is the second time through it's going to go into the development section. And I want you to listen for how unstable the development section is. I want you to notice that he uses some of the themes that we had up here, primarily the, the, the first theme, and he breaks it down in little fragments. So instead of da 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 instead of like quoting the whole thing, he'll probably just use that little fragment da 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 
da da dum 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 and you know he's just taking you through different keys he's using that little motif little motive of that primary theme just to kind of give it some unity and kind of remind you that you know we're we haven't forgot about that first theme it's still there um and composers can actually begin the development section again with completely new material but mozart kind of really sticks this primary theme here in the development so let's see what mozart did with that i'm going to mute the mic throughout the entire development because it's relatively short and um let me find where the second closing section is all right this is where the closing section this is again after the exposition has repeated uh, we are about to start the development here so I'm gonna mute the microphone and let that play All right, just to remind you, that's the end of the closing section there. It was a little further back than I remembered it being. So we're now about to go into the development. recognize that did you hear what that sounded like that sounded like we went back to the exposition except this time we we're in the recapitulation now I'm gonna let the recapitulation play a little bit you're gonna see that it goes from the first theme you'll notice that that transition section that we had before that's still there except this time it doesn't change key then it stays in the key of G minor for the second theme then it stays in that same key again for the closing section. And Mozart actually does have a coda for this. Um, so listen for that little extended section. Um, I'm going to walk you through it here. So we're back in what it sounds like the exposition. If you rewind it back, notice that sounds just like... Where are we up? I rewind it. I did it too fast. So this is the beginning of the piece. This is the exposition. It was around the five minute mark. Let me find that. And when we're done with the development, you notice it. See how it sounds just like the exposition? Except this time around, the, ex the first theme's going to play. And when we come up here on this bridge theme, it's going to stay in the primary key, that home key. Thank you. 
if you remember, that's the end, that little pause that Mozart gives us. Mozart's kind enough to give us a little pause there at the end of the bridge or transition. And now we're going to hear the second theme, uh, but it's going to be in the same key. And this, again, in kind of a, at least a subconscious way, gives you the impression that the first and second themes are getting along now because they're in the same key. So we have that. Then it goes on to the closing section that we had before. But instead of ending it there, you'll notice that he takes the orchestra into an unexpected, almost sounds like instead of it coming to an end, it's just kind of slowing down. And then he puts this very brief little coda at the end and gives it this final little flourish and the home key that gives you that final sense of finality and resolution. And that's the end of the first movement. You'll notice that nobody clapped. It wasn't because the audience was being rude. If you recall from one of our previous lectures, you do not clap, usually in between movements. There's three more movements to the symphony. We're going to learn that most symphonies are in four movements. The opening movement is almost always sonata form that we were looking at. All right, so that does it for sonata form. Now we're going to um, spend a little less time on the remaining chapters because they're fairly easy to explain. This is one of the easiest forms at all to explain. Matter of fact, its name pretty much tells you what it is. We have a theme, which we now know a theme is a musical idea, usually associated with a melody, that um, is reused throughout a composition. And you, know, you, sh you should hopefully know what a variation is. A variation is when you have something but then you slightly change it. And that's exactly what a theme of a theme and variations is. The only thing that you need to know is that unlike the sonata, the sonata form that we looked at, uh, the theme and variations can either be a movement that's part of a symphony, like your example here, Symphony Number no. 94. You'll notice for the second movement, Haydn uh, uses a theme and variations. However, theme and variations was also common to be a self-standing piece of music. So you could write a theme and variations on like someone else's melody. You may even recall from Amadeus, you may remember Mozart mentioning that he once composed a set of variations on a theme that Salieri wrote. So this was common uh, practice, especially for young musicians, you know, um, they would take a theme by another composer and then put it through variations. And you can think of variations as kind of a, a way of milking every bit of music you can out of a musical idea. Um, and composers were already doing this before we had the theme and variations. If you listen to like Bach and Handel, they would take a theme and then they would, you know, redress it and you know, set it in a different key, change the rhythm, change the harmony. Uh, basically, it, you can change any aspect of any of those elements we taught back way back in part one of your textbook. Things such as texture, things such as the, the key, um, the pitch, the instrumentation. There's any, you know, number of variations that you can do to the theme. Matter of fact, I found this piece of artwork online and to me, this demonstrates very much what a theme and variation is, like if you're going to represent it artistically. So you have the main theme here, and this is kind of the vanilla theme. This will be the basic thing. For instance, if this was like uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb, it would be like, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. It'd be the one that you're, you know, everybody's familiar with. However, in this one, notice it's, we still recognize it's the same guy, but it's colored differently. And then it's colored even diff more differently here. And he has different skin color. His shades are a different color. So this is the main theme here. This is variation one. This is variation two. And, you know, an artist could keep right on doing this. He could even, you know, change it from a man to a woman. And as long as he kept 
you know it's similar to the original your brain is going to recognize this is not something entirely new this is a variation so that's basically how themes and variations work now I've went ahead and prepared this video of this symphony playing Haydn's 94th Symphony. This is exactly when the second movement starts. And you will notice in your textbook that this one is actually called the Surprise Symphony. Now, the reason it's called that is because there is a surprise. And um, I'm not going to tell you what the surprise is, otherwise, it wouldn't be a surprise. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to task you with when you listen to this, either in this video or it'll probably be in you're required listening to um, to listen to this on your on you know, through your smart book or either um, well that's that's all you have to listen to we don't use the CD sets anymore do we um, but you'll hear that Haydn uses a theme and variation so before we go any further though we need to get this vanilla out of the way we need to hear what the basic vanilla theme is and so here's the theme that Haydn chose to pick All right, so that's the basic theme. He he a lot of times they will play it like you know two times to, to get you familiar with it and they often will do what he did there you know the first time might be loud second time might be quiet but there's not going to be any huge variation yet technically we're still in the first uh, presentation of it um, now the surprise hasn't come yet but I want you to be like I said on the lookout for how Haydn can use the theme as a variation so we're gonna back it up a little bit here and we're going to listen to what kind of variations he puts the theme through. Ah, did you see what the surprise was? Haydn actually snuck in, uh, and you'll listen as you listen through this, you'll notice he sneaks in little loud chords. And one of the reasons he did this is to keep his audience from going to sleep. He purposely chose this lullaby-like melody, this very soft, um, laid-back melody. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful melody, but it, it kind of sounds like a, a lullaby, doesn't it? So he's, you know, he's playing a nice soft lullaby, luring the audience into almost wanting to relax and doze off and daydream. And then, boom, he's playing a little joke on his audience. That's a surprise. So we still are in the initial stage here because there's a secondary part of the theme we haven't heard yet. Let's listen to the second half of the main theme here. that second little chord here now listen for this hear that hear how Haydn introduces a secondary melody or not necessarily a secondary melody but like a descant a kind of counter uh, part that's above it and so this is our first variation again we started off with just a vanilla now we hear this slight little variation here and that is a very subtle but very pleasant little variation that he put on it. And we're going to fast forward here a little bit. Now notice what he's doing here. He's put it in a minor key and he's having them all play in unison. And then he takes it back to major there. 
and we can still recognize that this is the main theme but he's changing certain elements as it goes through and again I'm not going to make you sit through the whole thing you'll you'll do that as part of your required listening um, but notice that all the different variations which we have a total of four variations and then there's a little closing section a type of coda if you will uh, that sometimes can be tacked on at the end but this is basically what a theme in variations is um, you, find either the standalone theme and variations or find it as in this case part of a symphony and you will notice that it has this basic structure you have a theme then you have variations see how easy that is very very uh, easy to understand now the next thing we're gonna look at is a minuet and trio minuet is a type of dance that became very popular and was widely used during the baroque period i actually have a, a minuet style dancing pulled up here for you to check out this is um if you want to see the uh youtube credits here i try to leave those in there so I, nobody thinks i'm trying to pass this off as my own material here um, but this is a um a dance group and they try to recreate what it was like to dance in the Baroque period. Now, I don't think that everybody danced this way. This is uh, the aristocratic, elegant, you know, if you were upper class or, um, you know, an aristocrat or someone like that, this is uh, the type of dancing they would do. And you notice that there are some people dancing and then there's some people watching and then you've got your musicians playing. So royalty, you know, they, they would learn these dance moves. And despite the beautiful Disney stories of you know these these lowly girls going and uh having fairy godmothers giving them dresses and allowing them to go to the royal ball they simply wouldn't be be able to be passed off as royalty because they probably wouldn't know the proper dance moves um this was part of how you identified and bonded as aristocrats is that you learned these um these dance moves and then you uh this was a type of courtship too the 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 method in which you danced with a female or or a male would often indicate whether or not you were available or seeking you know affection from someone so but this is a a, a minuet and you'll notice this is a very stately type dance this is an aristocratic dance and i'm just going to let you sample it here for a few seconds <laughs> So you've got these, you know, designated dance moves. You've got the spinning around. You know, everybody has to be at a certain place. It's a type of square dancing, if you will, for the aristocracy. The common people definitely had much more rustic and laid-back dances that didn't have complex mood, moves. They were more improvised. And so don't think that everybody danced this way. This was just the aristocracy mainly that did this. Um, now, that piece of music they were playing wasn't a true minuet because one of the things that you'll learn about a minuet is that it's in a triple meter. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the waltz is very similar in that you know they have that triple meter a lot of dance music would have triple meter because it has kind of a flowing type of feel to it but the basic structure for a minuet um, first of all don't worry about these little subsections here um, that the main thing I want you to know is that it's in three sections so it's easy to remember that it's in triple meter it's got three sections you've got the minuet which is the elegant stately dance and then you've got the trio section now the trio section was originally called that because if you probably figured out the trio means three uh, originally they would reduce it down to uh, three instruments uh, but that's not applicable by the time we get to the classical period and even though they still continue to call it a trio it's not necessarily just three instruments playing the trio section however is different from the minuet and that well whereas the minuet is stately and regal the trio is usually sweet and relaxed and a little more flowing so then it returns to the minuet and it's an abbreviated version of it 
Now, the only thing you need to pay attention to the, the small little sub themes here is notice that there's repetition at the end of both sections in the original minuet, and the second minuet is just a shorter version of it without the repetitions. Don't worry, this will all make a lot more sense here in a minute when we look at a minuet and trio. So, this is a minuet and trio from a, a serenade um, that Mozart composed. Uh, it's called Eine Kleine Nacht Music, and that in German means a little night music. So Mozart intended this for an evening party, a soiree, a nice little get together of you know people have a little party, and you would play this in the background, and then this would be the minuet and trio. Now, if you hear this today, it'll be performed up on a concert stage, and people won't be dancing. But who's to say when Mozart originally performed this, people? probably were uh, dancing. This was probably functional music, not considered art music so much back then. Um, but that is the minuet and trio. And uh, I, th I thought I had one pulled up here. And apparently I accidentally closed it before I started playing the video here. So we're going to, is it, is it the third movement? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, so we're going to listen to a, an ensemble here and you may be wondering why I'm not um, necessarily utilizing the um, the performances on here and the reason for that is that uh, the YouTube wants to flag it for copyright even though I'm using this under fair use um, I, it, I just don't really want to have to contest. You know, I had one other video taken down in the past and I had to contest it and it took a little while for it to get back up. So um, I was looking for actually this uh, here. Um, this, David. Of course there's an ad before it but uh, this group right here um, I'm hoping that they, it hasn't been taken down but they have a, uh, a performance that's rather good example here but when we look at the minuet and trio there's going to be um, now that's the first movement and you probably recognize that that's the bum ba bum ba 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 bum so let me hunt around here and I apologize this isn't already pulled up here I thought I already did have it pulled up Uh, no, let me find the right one. Ah, here we go. Alright, so this is the end of the second movement here, and we're going to go into the third movement, which is the minuet and trio. And let's look at our basic structure again. We have the main melody here, which is stately and elegantly performed. And you'll notice it does sound rather regal and sounds like something that aristocrats would dance to. So this is the main. At this point, we're ready to go into the trio. Um, and you'll notice at this point, up to this point, up to this point, it's been stately and regal. It's been played rather rigid. Now it's in the trio section again. Trio sections tend to be more sweet and relaxed. So listen to that. The end um, was shorter than the first time we heard the minuet. So minuet and trio is really easy to follow. It's uh, pretty easy to identify, and your textbook points out that it was a common choice for the third movement of multi-movement compositions. So if you have a symphony or a string quartet or a serenade or any of these that have multiple movements to them, the third movement is the is a popular choice um, to use as that movement it will be the minuet trio. Uh, now it does mention here that a scherzo, we mentioned that before, um, scherzo is basically the same basic form. Um, Beethoven really liked to use those and you'll see that scherzo is just a, a really a, a more lively even faster more rustic sounding version. Um, I tend to think of scherzos as being a little more middle class sounding than upper class. They don't sound quite as regal or as you know uppity you know dance on your tiptoes kind of stuff. Um, and so you check out some of the third movements of Beethoven stuff um, and like his symphonies and see if you don't hear a difference in those scherzos. However, minuet and trio is the primary choice by classical composers for a third movement. Unless, of course, if you only have three movements, in which case you will use this, which is called a rondo. 
Now, I'm not going to cover much on the rondo other than I'm going to mention that it was commonly used as the final movement. And some pieces had three movements, some had four, some had more. But whatever your final movement is, rondo or either sonata form, those were the two go-to ones because those really could end your pieces with a kind of a bang. And um, I have a video that you should check out on the rondo. If you go into the video section in Blackboard and go under classical period videos, there is a link here to the rondo. And I'm going to also try my best to get this video up on my new YouTube channel that this video is posted on, as well as these other videos when we talk about the concerto and the symphony. Uh, this was on my older uh, music appreciation um, uh, channel, and I've since started a new one since then. But you can still watch this video, and this video will walk you through and take you through the uh, what a rondo is, so pull it up. And there's the information there. Um, my old YouTube channel is Chris Wright Music. I believe if you do a search just for uh, my name, Chris Wright Music, and type in rondo, it should come up. Or maybe not. <laughs> YouTube changes their search algorithms so much it can be very difficult. I see some of my other videos in here, and there's even our one on the classical period, and, but um, needless to say, I'm going to try to get this one re-uploaded onto this YouTube channel so you don't have to hunt around for it in case if you stumbled across this video and you're not in my class. Now, if you're in my class, no excuses. You can access it through Blackboard. Again, just go under video section, go under classical period videos, and there you find it there. So that's going to conclude our video. If you have any questions about any of these chapters, chapters three through six, then please contact me. You can email me. Um, and uh, I will do my best to get back with you as soon as possible. But hopefully I've done a fairly good job of explaining sonata form. We explained theme and variations. We explained uh, minuet and trio. And again, Rondo, I'm going to hold off on that because I have a separate video that I'm going to ask that you watch to explain to you what a Rondo is. All right, we'll see you next time for more of the classical period. But that's going to conclude it for this video video.